So um, I'm going to talk about generalized divide and color models. This is joint work with Yuan Tickerson at uh, Chalmers. Uh, this is a class of models uh, that for many years I sort of felt deserve some type of study to look at them. Uh, sort of they seem very natural from a probabilistic point of view and there are a number of examples in probability that all, models that we all know that fall into this context. And so uh, it seemed reasonable to study these. And so this is what I want to describe to you today, some of the, some of the results we have. And there's a, and, uh, some different questions, a couple of questions I'm very interested in that I don't know the answer to. And maybe someone here has some ideas. Good. So the uh, D and C stands for divide and color model. I might accidentally say color model sometimes, but I always mean divide and color. The model is extremely simple. We have a, fi a, a set V, finite set or a countable set, and we have a random partition of V. The random partition of V can have any distribution you want. And we have a parameter P in 0, 1. And then the way the model works is with that input, we get an output, which is the corresponding divide and color model. These are 0, 1 valued random variables, X, V indexed by the set V, and they're obtained by first partitioning V, and then for each parti partition element, independently coloring all the elements uh, 1 or all the elements of 0 with probability P and 1 minus P independently. So let me just show you a quick picture. V is, has nine points. We do a random partition, happened to turn out like this. Now each of these clusters are colored 1 or 0, all the elements 1 or 0 with probability P and 1 minus P. It happened to look like this. And then we erase the partition element, and we're finally left that with that. That's a dividing color model. Also interrupt me anytime you want with, uh, with questions or comments. OK, so brief outline of the talk is I'll, I'll define, I almost did, definition of dividing color processes and some examples. Uh, then divide and color processes on finite sets, exchangeable divide and color processes, translation invariant divide and color processes, and so something we call threshold Gaussian and divide and color processes. So these are the different topics I want to go into. And then there'll be some questions. Uh, okay. So I sort of told it to you, but let me quickly do it again. Uh, what's the definition of the model? V is a finite or countably infinite set. Let part V be the set of partitions of V. And we'll let pi be a random element from this set, a random partition with a completely arbitrary distribution. Of course, in the end, you'll be interested in sp certain specific distributions, but here it has an arbitrary distribution. And we call pi a random equivalence relation, sort of a random partition. And the space of random equivalence relations on the set V will be den denoted RERV, random equivalence relation on the set V. And as I said before, given uh, pi and p, we generate this 0, 1 configuration on v by independent, by you, once you have the random partition, independently for each partition element, phi and pi, we assign all vertices in phi the value 1 with probability p, and all vertices in phi the value 0 with probability 1 minus p. And that's the divide and color model associated to pi and p. OK. And for, e for every fixed P, we have this mapping. It happens to be affine from random equivalence relations to the space of probability measures on 0, 1, V. In other words, if I give you a random partition, you have a corresponding divide and color process, which is, which is just a probability measure on 0, 1 to the V. And this map, uh, mapping is affine. OK. Uh, since other people already have uh, brought up the Easing model and always start off saying, well, in this audience, I don't need to tell you what the Easing model is. And since it's just an example, which won't be related to later, I, I don't think I'm, I'm not going to spend much time at the, on this at all. Uh, I'll assume, and it won't matter for later if you don't know it, the, what the Easing model with the zero external field is. And the main thing is that this is a, an example of a divide in color process. This is something. Uh, uh, this is something which is uh, known from the so-called fortschlein costa uh, representation. Uh, there's something called the random cluster model, which is some, a probability measure on the edges, which is not IID. And if you choose the edges according to this random cluster model, you get a partition. 
And then if you color the components, you get the random, uh, you get the uh, easing the e model. So I'm not going to spend uh, time on that. Uh, and the only thing, um, the only uh, comment I'll make as far as this example is the fu something called the fuzzy pots models, which is familiar to some of you, is, is also a divide in color process. Um, Random walk and random scenery is also a dividing color process. To the ergodic theorists, this is essentially, not exactly, but essentially the so-called TT inverse process, which has been important in ergodic theory. So what is the uh, random walk and random scenery? I'll first say it in words, and then we'll look at the slide. Basically, you do a random walk on ZD. Every point in ZD is colored one or zero independently independent of the walk, then you run your walk through it, and then it starts reporting to you the colors it sees as the walk moves through ZD. So XI will be a IID sequence of random variables taking values in ZD. That will be the steps for a random walk. And we let the walk starts at zero, and then at position time n, the walk is, you just sum up the, the steps. That's the associated random walk. CP, this will be an IID process indexed by where the walk is taking place in ZD, taking values 1 with probability P and, value with, and, val, and the value 0 with probability 1 minus P. This is the random scenery independent of the walk. And then the final process we're interested in, which is called random walk in random environment. It, it's a process. Yes? Random, I don't know what I said. Okay, random walk in random scenery. Uh, <coughs> that's defined for K bigger than equal to 0. And the process at time k is you, it just tells you the color of where the walk is at time s sub k, at, at time k. Uh, so it turns out that this is a dividing color process. So in this case, the index set is, uh, notice the index set is the positive integers. The walk's in zd, but the index set is positive time, so it's the positive integers. And if you simply define a random equivalence relation nu on the positive integers by letting i and j be in the same partition, you think an i and j is time, if the walker at time i and the walker time j are in the same location, that gives you a random partition, and then uh, it's almost immediate that, uh, that uh, the, the color process has distribution CP of nu. In other words, the distribution is the color process associated to this nu. So if you see it right away, you ignore the word almost. If you don't see it immediately, you can take solace in the fact that the almost is there. <laughs> OK, stationary distributions for the voter model. I'm not going to tell you what the voter model is. It's one of the interacting particle systems usually study, one of the usual models studying interacting particle systems. If you know what it is, great. The corresponding stationary. If you don't, ask a random neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <see>. Okay. <laughs> The, uh, station, so the stationary distributions for the voter model correspond to a specific color process. So what I'm going to tell you is I'm going to tell you I'm going to give you another RER, and the corresponding color process happens to be the stationary distributions for this interacting particle system that you might or might not know. Okay, so it's going to be a random equivalence relation on ZD. So we're on ZD. We consider, what we're going to do is we're going to start a random walk, continuous random walk at every location of Z, uh, ZD. And they're going to just, in the continuous time, and they're just going to start running. But when two walkers meet, they become one. So we have coalescing random walks. We run this up until time infinity. OK. And what's the equivalence relation? We define two locations, I and J, so we say i and j are in the in the same equivalence, same partition. If the walkers starting at these locations eventually coalesce, and we let nu sub d be the corresponding r e r. So the there's obviously a big difference between d bigger than to three and d equal one and two. And re, for a recurrent situation, obviously any two people will eventually meet. So this random partition is everything. It won't be very interesting. But for D bigger than to 3, it's going to be a more interesting uh, random partition. Um, and Holly and Liggett prove that the set of extremal stationary distributions for this possibly known so-called voter model on D Z ZD, it's precisely the image. It's, it's, you, you take this equivalence relation, 
and then you do the corresponding color process for any value of p, and as you vary p, you get all the extremal stationary distributions for the voter model. Um, okay, but even if you don't know the voter model, one of the questions I'm going to have later is about this RER, which I don't know the answer to, and I'd be interested in knowing, but we'll get back to that later. Uh, for D equals 1 and 2, uh, we'll skip that. Nothing's interesting. The whole partition's one element, and there's n nothing interesting. Uh, there's a cl something called the classical dividing color model. Uh, that's why we called the, the paper is called the generalized divide and color model because Ulla Hextrom introduced uh, this model in the case where the random equivalence relation is done as follows: you do ordinary IID percolation on the z-dimension on the d-dimensional lattice, and then you look at the corresponding components, and those are your partitions, and then you color those. And he looked at this, sort of thinking that if we if those if we did a more complicated model, the FK model, we'd get the EC model. What happens if we do a simpler percolation model, IID, and then he, he studied this. And uh, so he has a number of results, and there's a number of papers on this. Vincent has uh, some, of the, some of the papers in this, in this area. Okay, so let's move to quickly to the finite case. So DC sub V will be the collection of all divide and color processes on V. And let's, well, let's fix n, and so v is just the integers 1 through n. And one question one can ask is, if n and p are fixed, is this mapping from random equivalence relations to our 0, 1 process, is this injective? In other words, could I give you two different random partitions such that when you do this coloring, in the end, you, you, you get the same process, so that you can't recover uh, you, you, from the distribution. You don't know the, dis the, the, um, the distribution of the random partition just because you know the distribution of the color process. So that seems like a natural question. So I'm first going to mention a couple of the, re the results there. So for n equals 2, it's OK. Obviously, when p is 1, you can't recover, or p is 0. So of course, p is uh, between 0 and 1. So for n equals 2, it's extremely easy to see uh, that phi p is injective. You always can recover the partition. This is essentially a triviality. Um, already for n equals 3, something interesting happens. So for n is equal to 3, there's two different random equivalence relations. So if you define nu1 and nu2, as I'll explain in a moment, you, can e you check that when p is a half, the corresponding color processes you get are, in fact, the same. And hence, this mapping is not inject. And hence, this map in C one half, when n is equal to three, is not injective. And it turns out these are the two random partitions. In the first one, I do one cluster with probability two thirds, and with probability two thirds, everyone's in their own cluster. And in the second one, I do this. Now, this is, might be a little unclear because I haven't told you what who one, two, and three are. But whenever I draw a picture. Let's see, which is there. Whenever I uh, draw a picture like that, and I don't say 1, 2, and 3, what this means is you're going to do a random partition by, this, by definitely doing a 2, 1 split, and you do it randomly among the three possible 2, 1 splits. So you do it completely exchangeable. That's what that means. And you get the same thing. OK. Uh, so, so in other words, for phi 1 half, this mapping's objective when n is 2. And it's non-injective if n's big going to 3. So now let's move to p not equal to a half. And of course, not equal to 0, 1. Then it turns out that this mapping is injective if n is 2 or 3. But it becomes non-injective when n is bigger than or equal to 4. Um, so in particular, when n is equal to 3, p as a half is different from p is not being a half. When, P, when n is 3, when p is a half, you have non-injectivity. You can have two different random partitions giving the same thing. Uh, but when p is not a half, uh, you, can't, you, you can't get this. And th this difference between p is a half and p not a half, this is going to come back in other contexts, too. There's something very different about the p equals half case, the p not is a half case, although we don't really understand it, but we see the difference in certain cases. And later on, this little difference, we're going to see a, a consequence of this for the Easing model on a triangle, in fact. Um, OK, so I, I mentioned for n is equals 4, you ha it's non-injective. Um, and it turns out this is what you can do if you use 
if you, if you, give, if you give me any value of p, if I choose a random partition, the, the top random partition, and again, the 3-1 one, the one split means I do it uniformly among all the 3-1 splits, it turns out if I, these two partitions uh, yield, if I use p as my parameter, they yield the same color process. So we have non-injectivity when n is equal uh, to, to 4. Okay, and so uh, if we talk about the final exchangeable case, so far a lot of the things we have seen, this random partition has been completely exchangeable. Um, so we say that a partition is exchangeable if it's invariant under all uh, permutations. And equivalently, it's obvious what you're really doing is you're choosing a partition of the integer n into pieces, uh, K KS, K1 through Ks that add to n, and then you're choosing a partition of the set by uniformly choosing a partition with those sizes. That's clearly what we mean by exchangeable. And uh, all the pictures we've seen so far have been exchangeable. Hence, all the previous results I mentioned hold if instead of talking about random equivalence relations on this finite set n, we talk about it, it, it we, we replace it with exchangeable ones. Okay, so let's look at simultaneous non-injectivity. Could one have two different RERs, two random partitions, which yield the same divide in color process for every single value of p? Because in the previous, uh, in this case, the random partitions showing the non-injectivity depended upon p. And so you could ask, could, you, uh, could one have two distinct random partitions which yield the same color process for all values of p? And from what we've seen before, n would have to be at least four for this. And the first theorem is, there, is, there are two different random equivalence relations would generate the same color process for every value of p if and only if n's bigger than or equal to 4. So in the picture, it looks like this. So these two random e e equivalence relations, this last guy here has probability of sixth. They, they, um, for every value of p, they'll, they'll yield the same random equivalence relation. And here, it depends uh, it, it, it depends, one, two, th this is, these are not invariant, because here you have a one, three split, but you don't have a corresponding sort of one, two configuration. So these are non-exchangeable. And if you ask the same question in the exchangeable case, could one have two distinct exchangeable RERs given the same uh, the color process for all P? They are, the answer turns out, you can do this if and only if N is bigger than or equal to six. And this turns out to be this turns out to be the example for n bigger than equal to 6. This, this yields the same color process for every value of p. OK, so before moving to the, 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 the infinite cases, let me just mention a cute tidbit concerning the Easing model on a triangle, uh, which is a consequence of these results in a little calculation. So is the random cluster model uh, the natural, we know that gives a random equivalence relation to generate the Easing model. Is this the, the nat, um, is the random cluster measure the natural RER for the zero external field Easing model? It's the one we always use. And uh, looking at the triangle, the answer is perhaps not. So why is that? So since this map, when P is a half and N is equal to three, this mapping from random equivalence relations to dividing color models, since we had none, since it wasn't injective, this mapping, you can sort of think of it as a linear map, it has a one dimensional kernel, it turns out. And so there are RERs other than the random cluster model which yield the Easing model on the triangle. Now, since for P bigger than a half, since this mapping from RERs into color process is injective when P is not an equal half, the Easing model with the positive external field has, in fact, at most rep one representing random equivalence relation. Um, and it turns out it does have one, which we can denote by nu j. j is the interaction, and h is the external field. However, it turns out, as you let the external field go to zero, this random, the, the limit of this random partition doesn't correspond to the random, e, uh, the, uh, the random, the RER corresponding to the random cluster model. So you basically, uh, and so 
the consequence, if you want to obtain the Ising model with a very small external field as a divide and color process, you cannot just take the random, you can't just take the random cluster model and then perturb it a little bit and perturb the p-value a little bit. You can't obtain the, the positive external, the, the zero external field, the positive external field Ising model in that way. So basically what happens is this is sort of a picture. In the top line, the set of RERs that generate the zero field uh, Ising model is, is an interval, and there's a left endpoint and a right endpoint. It's not so interesting but I, uh, what they are, but I described them here. So the left endpoint is a, a, is a divide and color process that gives zero weight to a 2-1 split, and it gives some weight to these two, depending upon the interaction J. And the, right, and the right end has a different one. And on this line, you have the random cluster model sitting somewhere there. And if you take h bigger than 0 and take a limit of these uh, RERs, it turns out you approach another point. So you don't approach the random cluster model. So you could ask, what, of what significance is that? I, I have no idea if it's of any significance at all. That's, that's why I don't call it a proposition. I call it a tidbit. But... Uh, uh, if someone knows some significance of that, I'd be interested in hearing. Uh, is there a RER for the Ising model with positive external field and other graphs? Uh, okay, not, so not in, not in general, because when you add an external field on a general graph, the marginal uh, doesn't have to be the same for the different sites, even on interval length three, and so that can't be a color process. Um, if you assume the graph is transitive, I, I, the answer is I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, I wonder about that. Ken Alexander has a paper on FK models for fields with external, uh, EC models with external fields, but this is a more complicated setup and in fact doesn't fit into this more simpler uh, framework. Okay, uh, exchangeable RERs. So now we're going to go to uh, the situation of the positive integers, and we're going to look at a random partition, uh, uh, ra a random partition of that. If you got lost in the first half, half, if you've never seen a random partition of the positive integers, I encourage you to rejoin us. Uh, they're quite interesting if you've never uh, seen them. So the question is, how would you create a random partition of the positive integers, which is invariant? All the people are playing the same role. Well, of course, you could have the all in one cluster, or you could have singletons, and the question is, can you have others? And the answer is, you could have tons of other things. Um, a simple example is I could just have two boxes, and each integer I independently throw in the first box with probability a half, or the second box with probability a half. That will give me a random partition of the integers, and it will be exchangeable. And, and the question, so we say, okay, we say that it's exchangeable if the law is invariant under all permutations. We denote this by R, E, R, N, exchange. Uh, and th let me quickly describe them to you. This was a theorem due to Kingman. Uh, so first, an example is if you had a vector, P1, P2, P3, which was decreasing, and whose sum is at most one, you could create a random uh, exchangeable, uh, random equivalence relation was exchangeable by just doing the following. You have different bags, a first bag, a second bag, a third bag, a fo fourth bag. Each integer independently is thrown into the ith bag with probability p sub i. Um, and finally, with prob if the sum doesn't add up to one, with the remaining probability, you decide the person to be in their own, uh, own class. So this is an exchangeable uh, random one. This, and these are called paint boxes. And uh, the class, and this uh, class of exchangeable random uh, equivalence relations will be denoted RER exchange pure. They're in some sense pure, basically, because they're going to be the extremal ones. So, Why do we have to be decreasing the We always can make it decreasing. They have to add at most one. So I can make it decreasing. Yeah, yeah, in the, exactly. They don't have names. Okay, and Kingman's theorem says this is basically all you have. You first choose a P1, P2, P3, et cetera, randomly according to any distribution you want, and then you make this construction. Um, so this is, so every new and uh, every exchangeable guy is a generalized convex combination of paint boxes. In other words, it turns out to be a unique probability measure on these pure ones, such that by averaging them, you get your your exchangeable thing. What? V very, has very much to do with Definetti's theorem. Yes. 
Uh, okay, so um, so if I if I have one of these things and a p, then the corresponding I can look at the corresponding divide and color process. This will be an exchange. This will be an exchangeable process. And exactly as uh, Michael started saying, uh, we th we then can apply Definetti's theorem to the corresponding color process. What does Definetti's theorem say? It says if you have any exchangeable process x in 0, 1 to the n, it, there's some more general version, but 0, 1 to the n, then there's a random variable psi uh, in 0, 1 such that x can be represented as follows. You first pick psi at random according to your distribution, and then you choose an iid sequence with, pra with parameter psi. In other words, they're all just averages of product measures. That's what Definetti's theorem says. And in one of the standard proofs of Kingman's theorem, you use Definetti's theorem. OK, so what does the divide and color process look like? This I just want to do pretty quick. I'll just do one very quick one. Um, so if, if the paint box looks like this, it's, there, it's P10000. So there's one big box. And, every, and with the remaining probability, everyone's put in their own class, then it's not hard to see, if you think about it, that the corresponding psi for the corresponding dividing color process just has two possi possible values. It takes on this possible value. Remember, there's a p parameter in the, this is the p for the parameter in the color process. That's the probably you color the clusters, and the p1 corresponds to this p1. So this is this value with probability p, and it's this one with probability 1 minus p. So it's, if you think about it a little bit, you see that. And more generally, if you have any paint box situation, the, the, this, random, this mixing random variable, which is used to describe the uh, exchangeable process, it's, it turns out to have the following form. I'm not going to worry about all this. Th these first two terms are just deterministic, and then you're left with this term with the zi's or iid taking values 1 and 1 and minus 1 with probability p and 1 minus p and so in some in some sense this last term is what is called a bernoulli convolution uh, so so using uh, the above representation one can show with russ's help uh, that uh, the, the, this mapping from the, from, if you look at just exchangeable guys, sorry, the pure guys, the ones that come from these paint boxes, this mapping from paint boxes into the dividing color processes is injective. So that's for the pure guys. Any two pure guys, the corresponding color processes will be different, as long as P is not a half. Um, but however, if you look at all exchangeable paint boxes, uh, exchangeable uh, things, we don't have, for P the half, we don't, don't have injectivity. If you look at this particular random uh, exchangeable process, that's where we have two bags, each of weight a half, and we throw them into the two bags with probably a half each, and we look at the corresponding color, uh, color process, and we look at this non-pure random equivalence uh, exchangeable process, with probability one-half, we just take one big cluster, and with probability one-half, everyone is in their own uh, thing, class, then it turns out if you look at the color process for that, these two turn out to be the same. And so in particular, this mapping for phi one-half is non-injective. And I'm not going to spend, uh, it, tur it turns out that this non-injectivity, is, it's a very strong, uh, it's, it's highly non-injectivity. There's tons of collapse in this mapping when phi is a half. Um, I think, it, it turns out, I, I, won't, I think I won't cover all this, it, it turns out that these paint boxes, um, the, the ones where you just have, of the form P100, so you have one box, uh, with some probability and other, with otherwise you uh, singletons, basically these are the only important ones. So if you look at the convex hull of these guys, then it then it it, it turns out that you can you can obtain you can uh, you might if you only care about the final color process, you only really need to to look at these. That's that sort of uh, I'm not going to go into the 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 other ones. And one other comment is if we fix an exchangeable process. If you have a divide, uh, what follows, this has a, a consequence that if I have a divide and color process when P is a half, there's an obvious zero, zero one symmetry, 
when p is a half for any random partition. But it turns out that uh, in, the, in the exchangeable case, if you have something which is 0, 1 invariant, it turns out that it's a, it's a color process. And I'll mention this question at the end, but when p's, again, there seems to be a very big difference when p is a half and p's not as a half. So for p not, not a half, the behavior of phi p appears to be very different. And maybe, I, I don't know, maybe it's injective. So in, one, in the p is a half case, you have tremendous collapse. And when p is a half, uh, it, it, it seems to be more inje uh, injective. But we just have partial results in that direction. OK, so let me, so I'll, I'll, that last question I'll mention at the end. And now I want to go to the, any questions? Uh, so then I'll go to the, I want to go to the translation invariant case. And so a, so a translation invariant RER, if we, in the obvious mean, if we have a random equivalence relation, which is translation invariant, of course, this will yield the translation invariant divide and color process. And you could ask, it, 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 what kind of mixing conditions on the RER are needed in order to derive consequences uh, for mixing conditions for the final dividing color process? So one can investigate the ergodic properties of the resulting D and C process. So there are two easy cases. Case one, if your random equivalence relation produces an equivalence class with positive density. So maybe there's some partition, infinite partition, which has positive density. And in this, in this case, um, things are very easy. The corresponding dividing color process cannot possibly be ergodic, because if you have this infinite thing, it could have been 1 or 0, and you, you've changed the density. You don't have a, a, an almost sure density, so the final thing can't be ergodic. So you might as well rule out that. Another easy case is if it produces only finite equivalence classes. If all the class, classes are finite, this turns out to also be easy. In this case, the dividing color process basically inherits all of the mixing or ergodic uh, properties of the corresponding RER. And the proof of two is extremely simple. You can represent the dividing color process. It can be represented as a transla translation invariant function of your RER in simply an IID process. All you do is you look at your, your RER, and then to decide what to color things, one simply colors a cluster. You have each cluster is finite, so there's a top leftmost point to it, and you just take the bit there, and you color your cluster using that bit. So you can write the color process as a nice function of these, so it will inherit uh, all, all the properties of the RER. So these two things tell you the, what the interesting case is. So um, so the interesting cases are when there are infinite equivalence classes with positive probability, but they all have zero density. This is the only interesting case from, from this perspective. And the examples of this are the RER arising from a recurrent random walk in random scenery. So in that case, uh, we, that was one of the examples we saw at the beginning. So uh, yeah, so, yeah, so, okay, yeah, so the random, so, yeah, okay, the random, in the random walk and random scenery, the index set was just the positive integers, uh, which I think is your point. You can easily extend this to make the index set uh, all the integers in a, in a simple, in a simple way. So that's what the one I'm referring to, the corresponding extension. And, um, and then if you have a recurrent random walk, it's obvious that the equivalence classes are going to be infinite because you keep coming back to your same location, but of course on a set of density zero. So this falls into that context. And the other examples, the RER R -E -R consisting of your coalescing random walkers, this will also, um, there'll be, uh, all, all the clusters will be infinite, but they'll have zero density. So neither of the previous things tells us what happens here. Um, so first, in, uh, a couple of results. So if, if the RER -R is ergodic, or if it's weak mixing for the ergodic theorists who know what that means, uh, then and all the equivalence classes have zero density, that's what you need. So we know if, it's po if they have positive density, you're done. It's not ergodic. And as long as they have zero density, then the ergodicity or the weak mixing for the RER is passed on to the dividing color process. So the dividing color process is also ergodic. Um, and for mixing, the correct condition is 
if the RER is mixing and you, get, and you have this condition, if you take any two points and you look at what's the probability they're in the same random partition as the two points go to infinity, if that limit is zero, then the dividing process is mixing. And uh, a quick remark is this, this condition is sort of stronger than having all equivalence classes having zero density. And this condition is anyway necessary to being mixing. So, when, so the, if you don't have this condition, it's easy to check you can't be mixing. So that, that would be sort of an if and only if. OK, so I want to go back to these two examples. For, so again, for any recurrent random walk and random scenery, the corresponding random equivalence relation easily satisfies this, and so has only infinite equivalence classes of zero density. And the RER itself has very good mixing properties. So what the ergodics theorists would call its Bernoulli, I'm not going to tell you what that is, I have a, uh, but a way to think of that as a probabilist, is if you have a process, you could ask, can I write my process as a translation invariant function of a sequence of IID random variables? That's not unnatural from a probabilistic point of view, and that's equivalent to, uh, when I say Bernoulli, this is what I mean, or the, the ergodics theorists use a slightly defi different definition. So the... RER for the, rec the random walk case, it ha it, it, it's Bernoulli you can, because I can, I, the, the steps are IID, and I can describe for you the, the, the random equivalence relation in terms of the steps. Um, however, for, even, for simple random walk in one dimension, it turns out, don't worry about uh, if you don't know Kolmogorov, but it turns out the dividing color process is not Bernoulli. So the, this dividing color process can't be written as a translation variant fu function of IID random variables. And this was a uh, ve very big theorem from about 40 years ago. Uh, it was an open question uh, described differently. Essentially, by, by this was essentially proved by Calico, the only, uh, for the experts, he proved he was looking at the full system and then Hoffman showed how to for the full, full system, the steps and the uh, random walk and random scenery, you can just show the random the color process is not Bernoulli, but I'm not going to go into that. But the, anyway, this is a, a this turns out to be a, a, an example of a lot of interest historically to ergodic theorists, um, and it turns out if you knew it in a Kolmogorov automorphism, this turns out to be the simple ex example of something which satisfies this, which I'm not going to describe, and something which is not Bernoulli. And it was open at some point whether there were any examples. Ornstein gave the first example, but this is the simplest one to describe. Okay, so now the stationary distributions for the voter model. So again, the random equivalence relation has very good mixing properties. It's Bernoulli. So it's a translation function of IID random variables, basically because above each lattice point, I can just put a bunch of Poisson clocks telling you when to jump and who to jump to. And, um, and so I can describe everything in terms of IID random variables. Um, and the question is, is the corresponding dividing color process Bernoulli? Can you take this dividing color process, or what's the stationary distribution for the voter model, and write it as a translation variant function of IID random variables. So that's a question. That's a beer. So, the, <laughs> so the, if, if you tell me the answer to that, you get a beer. And it looks like a small beer, but you get a big beer. The fact that it's a small beer is more a uh, reflection of my, uh, my, my skill at making pictures and things like this, r rather than the size of the beer you would receive if you were to, uh, if you were to tell me the answer. So I'd be very interested in that. Uh, um, OK, so that's a question. I'm not going to worry about that. OK, so let me go into the last topic, uh, threshold Gaussian models. So in this part, what we're going to do is we're going to ask if a natural and interesting class of processes. So it, previously, I gave you dividing color processes, and we said, oh, let's ask questions about them. What kind of ergodic properties do they have, et cetera? Do we have injection from the random partition of the color processes? Now I'm going to take natural processes and ask, are, they, are these a color process or not? You could ask this for any ones, but I want to look at things that come from uh, Gaussian systems. 
Um, so we ask if a natural and interesting class of processes are D and C processes. So let me describe these to you. So X, X1 through Xn is a n-dimensional Gaussian random vector where each random variable is normal, 0, 1, and the pairwise correlations are non-negative. Okay, that's the only assumption. And now I'm going to basically get a 0, 1 random variable by, by just taking some level and cutting off using a certain threshold and seeing if the process is above or below that. So for any H bigger than that, don't think of field, think of its threshold. We consider a process Y sub H. It's an N vector, and it's simply given by the ith coordinate is 1 if the corresponding Gaussian random variable is bigger than or equal to H, and it's 0 if it's less than H. This gives us a 0, 1 process. And one can take, and the reason I, I wanted the non-negative of these correlations is because the only way the yi's could be non-negatively correlated is if these were non-negatively correlated. And I should have mentioned this earlier, every color process has pairwise uh, non-negative correlations, which is trivial. Um, so when is this a color process? And as I said, sigma j is necessary. So one theorem is if you take an infinite exchangeable Gaussian process and you take the threshold equaling um, zero, then this turns out to be a dividing color process. And this also works for infinite exchangeable so-called symmetric stable processes. And this basically follows from a fact I mentioned earlier that uh, all exchangeable processes which are zero, one symmetric are D and C processes. And of course, when I set the threshold equal to zero, I trivially get the zero, one, the zero, one symmetry. Uh, now I'm going to mention some results of my student who was here, who conveniently disappeared right before this talk to go back to Sweden, uh, Marlene Perler, on, on these questions. I mentioned four results. So there, there are Gaussian random vectors for which, uh, oh, oh, so let me just, so again, we do this for H equals zero. For H not equals zero, we don't know. Again, showing the difference between the P equals half case and the P not a half case. And we're going to see that coming up here too. So there are Gaussian random vectors for which Y zero, when you use a threshold equal to zero, it's not a dividing color process. And the example is you take four random variables, X1 through X2, X1, X2, X3, or IID, and you take X4 to be this com convex combination. And then it turns out the, uh, the, 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 the if, you, if you use this, uh, the, the corresponding threshold system cannot be represented in, by an RER. Um, on the other hand, if the process is a Gaussian Markov chain with non-negative correlations, in other words, it's a discrete time ornstein uhlenbeck process, then it turns out that the threshold zero is a dividing color process. And again, this is what H equals zero, if H not equals zero, I don't know. And this turns out, uh, she doesn't know, uh, this can be extended to stable Markov chains in situations where there's a tree-like structure. Um, another example uh, she has is that if, if you have a zero, one symmetric process whose configuration is constant, all ones are all zero with probably at least a half. This is, of course, a pretty extreme case. These are always divine and color processes. And a consequence of this is if you take Gaussian vectors where all the correlations are close to one, or if the Gaussian vectors are sitting in a two-dimensional Gaussian space, they're, they're generated by just two, two Gaussians, then if we take the threshold zero, we again get a dividing color process. And interestingly, as soon as you add H positive and look at the threshold above zero, if you take any non-trivial Gaussian triplet, x1, x2, x3, which is sitting in a two-dimensional Gaussian space, of course, if they're IID, you could represent it, but sitting in a two-dimensional Gaussian space, it's not a color process. So as soon as we go from H equals zero to H positive, the picture changes. And this seems to be occurring a lot. Uh, there might probably some general phenomenon. Okay, and so we again see P equals half is different from P not a half. Questions? So. Uh, this mapping I mentioned in the exchangeable case, going from uh, exchangeable random partitions into dividing color processes, uh, is this injective when P is not a half? 
we sort of checked this just on simple paint boxes, like where, there, where there's just maybe two or three of the PIs which are non-zero, and it was injective, which wasn't the case when P is a half, but uh, I don't know. I've asked a couple of people this question. Uh, when is a dividing color process Bernoulli? I, when can it be expressed as a factor of IID random variables? You could ask that generally, or in particular, the voter model. If, if someone could just tell me why the voter model is or is not a, a function of IID random variables, I'd be, as I said, very interested. Um, you could also ask when things could be expressed as finitary factors, for those of you who, who know what that means. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, there's percolation questions. There's, I'm not going to go with, there's some stochastic domination questions, but I think we're all getting tired and hungry, et cetera. So uh, I won't go into that. There it is. That's the question. So thanks for your attention, and congratulations to Russ again. <laughs>